1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. As we continue our series in the book of 1 Samuel, we've now really entered the, the second third of the book. So there's, the way that Samuel is structured, there's, you're really broken up into three parts. You're broken up into the first part, which primarily focuses on Samuel and Eli and the time where Israel comes to the point where they want a king. And that was the lesson that we did the other day where Israel is demanding a king. Then you move into the transition period of Saul and Saul being king. And then the third part of the book of Samuel is the transition uh, that, that leads up into and, and where the primary focus of the story is on David. And they're not broken up into perfect thirds. They're not exactly the same, but just gives you an idea that there's really three major parts, three big sections of the book of Samuel. And so what we're doing now is we're transitioning into that second phase where it's primarily focused on Saul and his kingship. So with this, we'll go ahead and switch over to 1 Samuel 9. Well, a little bit of context first, because I do want to bring this up, because Samuel has started his search for a king. That's another important part of this. So not only has Israel demanded a king, what we see earlier in this chapter is Samuel transitioning into starting to actually look for a king. He's, he's got his ear to the ground and his eyes forward trying to find someone who will be the Lord's anointed king. And then Saul, un, you know, not really thinking about this or thinking that he could be king, what's happened with him is he's out roaming around by himself because he has lost his father's donkeys and is trying to find them, you know, very humble beginnings for King Saul. And so he's wandering around with a servant trying to find the donkeys, and this is really the episode that we find ourselves in in 1 Samuel 9, verses 5 through 8. When they came to the land of Zerf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come and let us return, or else my father will cease to be concerned about the donkeys and will become anxious for us. He said to him, Behold, there is a man of God in this city, and the man is held in honor, all of all that he says surely comes true. Now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us about our journey on which I have sent out. Then Saul said to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For if the bread is gone from our sack and there is no present to bring the man of God, what do we have? The servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have my in my hand a fourth of a shekel of silver, I will give it to the man of God, and he will tell us our way. A couple really interesting things, because it's really easy to look back at this and, and to sort of corner off different Bible characters into categories of good guys and bad guys. And the truth is, sometimes the Bible itself even does this. It'll actually introduce a king of Israel, for example, as... Uh, blank began to rule at this time, and he did that which was evil in the sight of God, or blank began to reign at this time, and, and he did that in the time of this king, and, and he did that which was right in the sight of God. So sometimes the Bible even does that for us. But it's really easy for us to forget that these are real people. The Bible isn't just a storybook, and it's not just a character that has a white hat or a black hat, somebody that is specifically designed to be a hero or a villain. Saul is a person. And like people, he changes over time. This is when Saul is a young man. He's not king. He, he's not the uh, malevolent villain that we come to know a little bit later in this same book. Right now, Saul is just a young man trying to tend to his father's donkeys and, and go about his business as a very humble Benjamite living in Israel. And it's really interesting to see some of the things because there's a lot that I think this passage actually says about Saul's character in this particular passage. First of all, Saul sees it as very beneficial and actually seeks out God's counsel. It's not just that Saul is flippant about it or that uh, Saul just sort of disregards it. Saul is somebody seemingly that believes in God, that follows him, so far as we know, for all of Saul's fl flaws, and he does have many of them. Saul was not an idolater. 
even though the vast majority of Israel at his time continued to have issues with idolatry, to my knowledge, there's never at any point a reference or a indication that we have that Saul, even though he was not always loyal or obedient to God, ever engaged in idolatry. So the fact that he is remaining monotheistic is probably something that's safe to assume here. And when this suggestion comes to him, it's like, let's consult with God. We, we, we're having this problem. Let's go to God first. You know what? That's an attitude that I really admire. I wish that I had it more, and I wish that other Christians had it more. That a practical, real-world problem, because, of course, you pray to God and, and go to him for spiritual issues as well as we should, but Saul is, is out there having a real-world problem. We're, we're having issues finding our livestock, and, and this is something that, especially back then, that was your livelihood. That's how you made your money. I'm, I'm not sure if these donkeys were just breeding donkeys that they sold to other people or they were using for plowing, whatever it was. This was a thing of value that the family used as a part of their livelihood to sustain themselves. The donkeys go missing. They can't find them. What is the reaction? Let's go to God. Let's go to this prophet who happens to be in this city. We will inquire of him because he is a man of God and see what he has to say. And surely he'll lead us to whatever destination it is that we're, that we're trying to find. I mean, how much better would our lives be? And I'm, I'm preaching to myself here, believe me. Uh, prayer life is, is one thing that I honestly, to, to a certain degree, struggle with and, and wish that I did a lot better. How much better would our lives be if we took this same attitude that Saul has here? That when there's an issue, and, and you know, it wasn't Saul's suggestion, it was the, the servants, but Saul's readily, oh yeah, let, let, let's go, let's do that. That seems to be the thing that we need to do. That where, wherever we're having a problem in life, our first inclination is, Let's go to God about it. Let's consult God. I want God's advice. This is something that we need to do. Because it would not be outside the realm of a uh, possibility. It certainly wouldn't be something that would be foreign for Saul to dismiss this if he were not somebody that really believed in God's power. It would be easy for him to give the excuse, no, that's going to waste time. We're, we're already looking for the animals. This could give them time to get further away. Saul has a lot of confidence in God's power and, and confidence in his prophet, and that's the reason that he relents and says, yeah, let's head back to the city. We'll seek out God's favor, and, and once that happens, our problem will be solved. That's a pretty astounding amount of faith for the young Saul. And there's a second portion of this as well, which I think is equally, if not more important, that even though this is something that Saul very much seemed ready, eager, and wanted to do, and saw it as something that was valuable and coveted and something that he should seek out, he also, because he understood its value, we need to show our appreciation. We need to do something to show that we appreciate God's help and God's favor with this. There is some kind of gift or offering that we need to offer up in return for seeking out God's wisdom. It's not like, you know, we're going to pay the guy off because they could have gone without a gift. That's also an option. But Saul thought it was something that was important to bring some kind of offering to not show up in the empty-handed. Especially in Jewish culture, this was really, really important. It's, it's, not, it's just not the same as it is today after the partition between man and God has been broken down by Christ that we really understand, because we're living in a very different spiritual culture as well as physical culture, that when you, you brought in a sacrifice for virtually everything back then, that if you're going to go to inquire of God, you need to have something in your hand. You don't show up empty-handed as a sign of both respect and appreciation. We need to have something that we're offering to God and show Him our gratitude for solving our problem and telling us, where the donkey is, or where the donkeys are. That shows a really great attitude, too. That's something that I think that we can learn from. That even though God doesn't, quote-unquote, need anything from us, and we understand that what God gives us is the gift of grace, shouldn't we have a desire to not show up to God empty-handed? Shouldn't we, like the parable of the talents, for example, want to do work and, and to do good and to help our brothers and sisters and to, to help the stranger, all of those things, shouldn't those be things that we should want to do 
A, because God commanded it and it's the right thing to do, but B, so that we don't show up empty-handed, that when we are making requests and, and asking God things, it's not like an exchange, because in the same way that we can't work our way to salvation, we can't work our way to get God to do what, what He wants, but out of appreciation and respect for Him, we should want to not show up at the throne of grace with a request, knowing that we have been an unprofitable workman. Saul had that same attitude. If we're going to seek out God's help, we need to show up with something. We need to have some kind of gift in our hand that we can present to show our appreciation for what God has done for us in helping us with this problem that we're having. And I think if you were to sum up the real message behind this passage, it's that God's advice, God's counsel, and God's wisdom should be both valued and appreciated. And that is something that is true whether you're a Benjamite living in Israel 4,000 years ago, well, not quite that long, but, uh, you know, a few thousand years ago, or whether you're living in America in 2020. That's something that has always been true and is always going to be true, that God's wisdom should be valued and we should show appreciation for him and for who he is and for his power and for his knowledge. Stay the course, friends. <laughs> Studies show that YouTube videos featuring attractive women get far more likes and subscriptions than ones that don't. This is especially true if she's exotic looking. Luckily, in the modern era, there's an easy way to work around this. You see, I identify as a very attractive Hispanic woman, so now you have to like this video and subscribe to my channel, otherwise you're just an evil, heartless Nazi that hates brave, liberated, beautiful Latina women like me. Checkmate, woke brigade.